Hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest Cornwall Insight podcast. I'm really pleased to say that we have a very special edition for you today in advance of our Cornwall Insight live event on the 5th of November. My name's Robert Buckley, and I'm Head of Strategic Accounts at uh, Cornwall Insight. And I'm really pleased to say today that we're joined by Suket Singhal, who is Chief Executive of Secure Meters, one of our partners, one of our primary partners for the event next week. And Sakat is here with us to talk a little bit about some of the contributions and ideas that he will be making uh, on the day, uh, specifically in the panel session that we have about achieving affordable net zero 2030. Uh, Sakat is chief executive of Secure Meters, who've had a long-standing commitment to the British energy market as manufacturers of metering equipment and providers of insight and, and data services therefrom. I'm really pleased to chat to Saket today about some great ideas and experiences that Secure have had, which uh, I think, Saket, you you feel could make a really positive contribution to the the immediate challenges of of affordability and managing networks. Wonderful, Rob. Thank you so much for having me join. Uh, I think this is a really exciting discussion to have and the build up to CI Live. It would be wonderful to to get some thoughts of the people who are coming. You know, who are secure? We're a 37-year-old company and have been delivering energy solutions to the whole energy value chain over that time period. Our core expertise is in building reliable devices, doing consistent uh, world-quality data collection and world-leading analytics. And I think that's where, where we're quite different. Another area we're really different is that we have a very unique customer base. A lot of people who are providing technology and energy solutions um, are quite narrowly focused on the utilities or just on the industrial commercial side. And we've been working over the years to build a utility and a industrial commercial base. So we understand the generation of power, the transmission of power and the consumption of power as well. And we've been in GB pretty much ever since the start. We've been a very significant metering provider back to the DNOs before deregulation. And uh, since the uh, start of the smart metering journey, both SMETS 1 and SMETS 2, uh, we also have the um, luxury of having called ourselves a downstream integrated player. So we owned Utilita uh, until about 2017 when we when we sold them on. We took them from um, a few tens of thousands of customers to three quarters of a million customers on the basis of the metering technology and how IT systems should work with that metering technology. And that was actually a phenomenal experience. Um, it gave us a much better insight to the GB market, but also it gave us a very good insight of how retail businesses, supply businesses need to use intelligence and, and use data in order to create operationally efficient products. So that's secure in a bit of a nutshell. Okay, that, that, that's really interesting to hear. And I, I actually wanted to pick up, as I know you will on, uh, on the day, is the way that we think about smart metering different in Great Britain compared with other markets where, where you're active? Essentially, are, are we missing a trick here? Yeah. I don't think it would be fair to do a very detailed comparison of, of each market or of each geography because there are a lot of different market structures are different, regs are different, demographies are different, housing stock. I think it would make more sense to compare goals. Uh, that was set for smart metering programs and also learn from the challenges that have been faced uh, or challenges that have been overcome in places like Australia and mainland Europe and, and Asia. It's really unfortunate. And, and as a member of the metering industry, it, it galls me. But, you know, most, not all smart metering programs essentially start with a very simple goal of efficiency and building trust with better builds. Now, you know, that's a huge expense and it's a lot of technology and it's a lot of hard work that is going for what seems like a very small bit. I mean, you speak to anybody, you speak to any regulator, you speak to any government, you speak to any utility. In the background, they always have this aim that it needs to support the energy transition. It needs to help us be a better business. It help, needs to help us deliver better products. But it's almost never, ever been worked on. And a lot of the added benefits and the added value that can come from having a connected home that can come from more granular data has actually not been delivered anywhere in the world. And that's really, really unfortunate. Maybe, you know, that's some of the stuff that we can, we can explore in the future. And when I look at all of our custom base, um, through APAC and EMEA, um, you know, some of the common challenges, and I think GB is no different in, in a lot of areas around execution and implementation. Uh, for some reason, these programs, which uh, when they start off are slated to be three, four, five, seven-year programs, they are always elongated. 
and, and move to the right and sometimes far too far to the right which means that all industry participants are spending more time than they wanted on the implementation phase and getting the system change correct. So adding that value, doing something different becomes a challenge. The, the, the experience in Great Britain of, of delay and extension is, is not unique then? No, it's not unique. I'll put my neck on the block and say, maybe the delays and extensions in GB are um, more than they needed to be and more than some of the other programs. Mm -hmm. Delays and extensions are quite normal. So, so, that, that's, so, so when we go about implementing these things, maybe we perhaps in hindsight could have done them a bit more efficiently, but when we've got the data there, are we, are we using it as best we can or do, is there more that we can be doing? Uh, again, you know, I think GB is not unique in this. Um, most, if not all, uh, smart metering programs, like I said earlier, fail when it comes to delivering greater value other than just a, a more effective bill and lower customer complaints. The reality is that a cornerstone of the successful energy transition has got to be every part of the industry stopping using heuristics or rules of thumb that have been developed over the last 30 years. But, you know, one of the reasons for that is we must reflect on the whole system. The energy system hasn't seen any substantial change other than growth or deregulation and competition since the Second World War. The way we were doing things in the 40s is pretty much the way that we're doing things in the 2020s. Um, and in the energy system of the old, which was quite static, everybody was quite similar. Or for example, you know, when it came to what does my house look like and your house looks like, it was a simple rule of thumb. Both our houses are one kilowatt of energy and the system worked because your one kilowatt was, you know, at 200 watts at some point and mine was at 1.5 kilowatt. The reality is that this isn't true going forward. Actually, the reality is it's probably not true now as well. And that is the piece that we need to recognize and we need to change as an industry and use the granular data that is coming out of these instruments, of these measuring devices. And I'll give you some examples of how, you know, half hourly data can be used. Um, and, you know, we can, we can, we've got a mandatory half hourly sentiment coming in, in, in over the few months. And, you know, it's about being, being fair. Um, and I view it from fair to whom? Is it fair to customers or is it fair to the industry? But actually, if you look beyond that, and if you actually start to view this from the customer's lens, then you can actually do some really, really good tariff designs where you really reduce the cost of energy for the customer, but you protect your margin because that half hour in data can tell you exactly what you need to be uh, buying and selling for customers at that time frame. Um, we've worked with some customers and we've done a much better job on the day ahead and week ahead forecasting, you know, the conventional algorithms that look at your portfolio and provide you some forecasts about the day ahead and week ahead. But actually, if you pull half hourly data from previous day or the previous week, and you use that to move a day ahead and week ahead, you can get some incredibly improved forecasting algorithms. And also, you know, how do we look in our homes? And um, this is where I believe customer segmentation becomes really important because not everybody is the same anymore, as I said. And therefore your home, uh, you might just want a simple, I've got a two bed flat. I just want the deepest energy bill. I want it to be right. I want the convenience to pay. And that is possible to do. And my home might have the ability to have a few distributed energy resources, which might need some orchestration. And that's what half hourly data can do. And similarly with the networks, you know, a heuristic, which most of the networks around the world have used in some flavor or the other is, you know, if 70% of my, um, uh, transformers are underloaded 70% of the time, then I've got network capacity. Again, if we see what we've seen over the last 10 years, that heuristic isn't working and you need to be quite clever how you're dealing with rural transformers, how you're dealing with urban transformers, how you're dealing with urban substations and getting the granular data can very often allow orchestration because there's enough capacity available. So you've, you've talked about data coming from customers, buyers, and into networks. How can the network side and the customer side learn from each other? Because presumably there are benefits to be had from putting everything together. Absolutely there is. And again, GB is not unique. Getting different industry participants to use the data and integrate it into their systems and convert it to actionable information is a challenge which everybody faces. I think um, I both agree and disagree that the smart metering data from our homes is what should be used by the network. And I'll try and explain why. 
Uh, ultimately, there's a rule of thumb which says if if you have visibility of 70 to 80 percent of the homes on your low voltage networks, then you can do the low flow analysis and the analytics. You could build that up to get a real clear visibility of what's happening. But what we found working with our global customer base is actually getting an accurate electrical interest every day, every month is a big challenge. What ends up happening means like because you don't have any visibility from the sub transmission network right into our homes, there's quite a sort of black hole, there's no dashboards, there's no information. It becomes increasingly difficult to figure out which transformer or which feeder my home is connected to. And therefore, what we have been doing in India and Asia for a long time is um, in a cost effective manner, we've been providing instrumentation and devices for all distribution transformers, whether they be 100 kVA or 1 MVA. And what that does is that provides utilities, uh, the network operators, with very clear visibility of uh, part of the network where they've been sort of flying blank. And it doesn't need to be really expensive. Uh, the devices are what the devices are, and the installation costs can be ameliorated by incorporating them into the um, preventive maintenance schedules. What I have found is that one of the biggest deterrents for DNOs around the world for doing this is how do we put this data into actionable information? Uh, you know, what is it that we can do? Because everybody's there sort of been trained to say, we, we need to develop our own algorithms. And I think this is where DNOs need to be slightly different. They need to take that metering information and let technology providers that are building these brand new algorithms for the utilities around the world to learn off their gear from Australia and India and let technology providers give them some of that. Because the benefits of what it will do is it could delay spends. It could mean that you could delay spends by one or two years on the networks. Because the reality is this is where the largest investment is needed wherever you are in the world. Both medium and low voltage networks are going to need a lot of bold string and a lot of uh, augmentation. And if you can delay spends even by one or two or three years, that's really beneficial to all of us and the nation as a whole. So so that's the that's the prize that we're going for. Is there a picture into the wider market structure? I mean, obviously in, in GB, we've, we've been having a great debate about how, whether or not we need to restructure our wholesale market. Is there a prize here that, that we understand better what's going on amongst the bulk of consumers or, or, is, that, or is that trying to run before we can walk? <laughs> I think I'd like to go backwards before I go forwards a little bit. And one of the things that we are seeing with a lot of government smart metering and, and uh, retailer-led, supplier-led programs around smart metering is that people tend to remain wedded to decisions that were made some 10 or 20 years ago even. And this hinders both the reform and the innovation that is actually possible uh, within the industry today. I've been reflecting in, in preparation for next week as to what is it that provides this deterrent, this hindrance. And I can only come up with sort of two things. Uh, the first being probably trust on, and cybersecurity being the prime driver of why industry or government wants to create a slightly closed system or a system with reduced access, uh, which is in direct conflict to letting industry participants use the data and the user services that are available. And the second is probably a sunk cost uh, or the desire to sweat the asset because, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of pounds and dollars have been spent so that the overall costs can be reduced. I think a structural change which everybody should make is actually rely on security through diversity. Uh, a single system, it can be a huge point of failure. It can be a focus point for any cyber terrorist to attack, but smaller bespoke systems, just because they're diverse, just because they're working on some demographics which are segmental, on some solutions which are segmental, they provide security in their own right. Also what happens is they're not that costly to develop and deploy because they're working for, not for 27 million homes, they might be working for 2 million homes or 200,000 homes. They're actually quite easy to deploy. You can fail often and you can learn fast. Because ultimately, these are the goals. I think getting customer segmentation correct, and it's not 150,000 segments, which Amazon has, but it's also not the four or five archetypes that Ofgem have today. The reality is that somewhere in the middle, you can have 15 or 20 different customer segments to understand where homes are. And that's where if we could put the customer at the front um, and we realize that as far as most customers go, they really don't understand energy and their engagement with energy is, I turn the light on, it came on, I, I was able to cook. We build some fit and forget products so that it's really, really easy for them. And then there are some homes and small businesses where we can be quite cute about how do we actually orchestrate the uh, distributed energy resources that are available. 
and can we develop some products? I think the wholesale markets are going to have a huge benefit as well. We can be forecast better. Balancing volumes can reduce. Then the risk around balancing reduces and also the costs around um, spare capacity can reduce. Uh, similarly with networks, networks can use not only the active energy that is available in a better way, but I think one thing that can hit us really bad is reactive energy and voltage support in rural areas and, and down long lines. So I think there's a huge amount of benefit, but we probably need to think about things a little bit differently. Some of the innovation and the market reforms need to come from loosely coupled systems, which can be food and loss data, which is coming from that central monolithic system, or it can be generating data under that MPAN or in a slightly different way. So, so this would be about innovation in, in terms of opening things up for the market to develop r rather than imposing you know, centralized programs that then ripple out. That for me, I think is one of the, the big learning points for, from this. And that I'm sure we will pick up in the debate on on, on Wednesday. And also I think Sika, uh, some of the thoughts that you've touched on, you, you, you've done a, a summary one pager of, of, of issues around this, which which I think we're both going to be circulating as, as part of some research that we're working on together, all in, in aid of stimulating some thoughts from 300 or so people from the industry that we're expecting to come along to our event. And, and obviously very much looking forward to yourself uh, and your contribution to care and the support of Secure Meters in, in enabling the event to happen. So many thanks for your time today. Uh, and uh, we very much look forward to picking up the discussion next week and hope our listeners have found this a useful introduction. Uh, thank you very much, Rob. Uh, it's been wonderful to have this conversation and get the thought process going. I completely agree. We need to think differently so that we can harness the benefits of the assets that have been deployed and turn it into actionable information. <laughs>